Everybody surviving this morning? I barely am. So just wanted to get that out there right away. Uh, I assume there's some of you out there. You'll notice I have my computer. I forgot my iPad this morning. I also, as my wife reminded me, I forgot to fix my son's hair this morning. If you've seen his hair, it's like, you guys know what I'm talking about. Some of you are judging and some of you guys are like, it's so cute. I know there's a line. And I would also remind you that I forgot to do my own hair this morning. <laughs> so if it looks acceptable and you didn't notice until this moment, then I guess that's an act of the goodness of God in and of itself. Uh, but yeah, life has been stressful this morning, and I don't know about you, but even so, and maybe even especially so, that makes it that much sweeter to be here, to be here with you all. So I'm looking forward to uh, speaking this morning. I'm looking forward to sharing God's word this morning. So um, here's a quote. What is good? Good is what God approves. We may ask then, why is what God approves good? And we must answer, because he approves it. That is to say, there is no higher standard of goodness than God's own character and his approval of whatever is consistent with that character. We've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit for the past several weeks, and we've just got a couple more left, and then we're going to be transitioning to a little bit more of the gifts of the Spirit and talking about how the Lord gifts uh, his body. Uh, so the fruit that we've talked about so far, love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. Right? Anybody feel convicted about kindness over and over and over again this week? I had like 10 of you tell me at different points this week, oh my goodness, it's just so hard to be kind. And I resonate with that entirely. And so I just wanted to throw that out there and say, I'm glad I'm not the only one. And I'm also glad that the Lord is using his word to bring, and his spirit to bring conviction in our lives about that. So we've talked about these things. These are all elements of God's character. Right? These are all really significant components of the character of God that his spirit instills in us his people. And this morning we're going to contemplate another slice of godliness, goodness. So you might be thinking, well, what's the difference between goodness and kindness? Anybody thought about that before, asked themselves that question? What's the difference between goodness and kindness? Because they kind of sound like the same thing, and it kind of sounds like just being nice, right? Like be nice. Be kind, be good, be nice, do good works, do kind works. Like it all kind of sounds like the same thing. So obviously, as we've talked about, and as you've hopefully been able to see yourselves over the past few weeks, there's a lot of overlap. When we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We're talking about godliness in our lives. There's a lot of interconnectivity there, right? And kindness and goodness maybe overlap more than most. But in order to understand the difference between kindness and goodness, as it re relates to God's character, as it relates to our character, as it relates to how we relate to one another, we've got to do, as we have every week, we've got to understand what that word, goodness, is really means in scripture in the new testament so the word that paul uses in galatians 5 is the word agathosin which doesn't describe something we do as much as it describes something that we are something that is intrinsically good in nature goodness that shows itself in spiritual moral internal excellence and so another uh, synonym that comes to mind for me here is virtue, internal, intrinsic, by nature, goodness. And so for our purposes this morning, and, and we're going to get into this in just a minute, but for our purposes this morning, I want to think about goodness less as something we do and more as something that we are in our hearts, in our character. And so goodness as a characteristic of God, and therefore us as his people, is spiritual, moral excellence, okay? Okay. So like Wayne Grudem said, that, that first quote I read just a minute ago was from Wayne Grudem, and he said that as Christians, we believe that good is that which God is and approves of, by definition. Okay, we have nowhere else to go. We have no other basis for our morality, our own moral excellence than the character of God. It's the standard of goodness, God's character and the things that God approves of and, and desires and commands in the lives of those who follow him. And so many, of the, as we've talked about all, all these other different things, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of these are things that originate in the heart of God, and goodness is no different. Okay, which brings us to our main idea this morning, if you're following along in your notes. Goodness flows from the heart of God, through the works of God, into our hearts, and then through our works to others. 
You see the progression there. Goodness begins in the heart of God, and then it plays itself out. It works itself out into the, through the works of God into our hearts, and then, then from our hearts into the lives of others through our works. Goodness, all goodness, all natural goodness begins in the heart of God. His heart is purely and flawlessly and perfectly good. And that goodness flows out of him. That goodness flows out of his works in this world. To me, most beautifully and most specifically through the works of Christ. And then it flows into our hearts as his spirit produces that same type of godliness in us. And then as Jesus teaches in Luke 6, this passage that we're going to read in just a minute, uh, that goodness that he places within us ought to produce itself in good works toward others. And so since we really focused on doing kindness last week, I want to look at this passage in Luke 6 that talks less about goodness as an action, though it's there, and more about goodness as an adjective, goodness in the heart. And we're going to tie it together with some of the verses preceding that. So turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6, if you haven't already. Luke chapter 6. We're going to be reading, I want to read this morning, verses 39 through 45. This is Jesus teaching, and this is what he says. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck, take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. This is right at the core of one of Jesus' most famous sermons, and he's talking about goodness. He's talking about righteousness and goodness. In verses 39 through 40, these verses where Jesus says, Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into the pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. In these verses, Jesus is essentially warning the crowd about who they spend their time with, about who they listen to, about who they follow, about who they emulate is going to have an impact on the level of goodness in their hearts. If they blindly follow and emulate someone who is not full of goodness and not full of righteousness, they're going to find themselves not good and not righteous. They're going to find themselves in the bottom of a pit. They're going to find themselves lost and lacking. On the other hand, if they follow and emulate someone who is righteous, someone who is good, they're going to find themselves growing in goodness. And then he asks this famous question to help us see, to help me see, to help you see how easy it is to spot a lack of goodness in somebody else and how much we struggle to see a lack of goodness in ourselves, our own sin. So that lack of goodness, we're going to call it sin this morning. Because that's what it is. And so this is where goodness begins, seeing that we're not it. Goodness begins with acknowledging our own lack of it, our own sin. So Jesus asks this question in verse 41. Follow along with me. Maybe you've heard this question before. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log or the plank that is in your own eye? The speck and the log here are the same thing, okay? They're made of the same consistency, sin. They're both a lack of goodness, the presence of sin. If God, if God's character and what God approves of is good, then what is not good, what is sin, is what is not God's character and what God does not approve of. And so Jesus is really asking this question. Why do you see the sin in your brother's life, but you do not notice the sin 
that is in your own. So here's the point Jesus is trying to make. It's the next point in your outline. We are quick to notice sin in others, but slow to notice sin in ourselves. And it's like this, Jesus said. I've got an example for you guys this morning. I don't know if anybody noticed this back here. It's like this, Jesus says. You've got this plank in your eye, and you all laugh. You laugh because you see there's a plank in my eye, right? This is no good. And it's like me looking at Steve and going, hey, I think you got something. I think. Is it right there? I think you got something in your eye, Steve. I see that speck. I see it. You see it, right? You see, the, you see that speck? Do you see the speck in your eye? Oh, man, I see it. Everybody else sees it, right? Like, right? like there's this, you know what I'm saying? It's like it's this silly. The Lord is saying this is how silly it is. You have this huge plank sticking out of your eye, and all you're doing is looking past it somehow at everybody else's sin. All you're doing is looking at everybody else's little specks in their eyes, and you're just hoping that everybody will look at their specks and not the log in yours. It's silly, Jesus says. That's how goofy it is. That's how wrong it is. You become a hypocrite. You become a pretender when you look past the log in your own eye straight into the speck in someone else's. And now this eye's a little blurry. Man, it's like holding this log up in your eye and saying, really, you don't see the sin in your life? I see the sin in your life. Everybody else sees the sin in your life. You don't see it. I can see it. Right past this log in my eye, I see your sin. Everybody else sees it. Mm. Man, you really have a speck in your eye, don't you? It's foolish. It's foolish. It makes us hypocrites, Jesus said, when we're slow to notice sin in our own eyes, but quick to see it in others. There's something you all need to know about me. I don't like the zoo, Okay? I'm sensing some antagonism in the room right now, but I do not like the zoo, and I especially, I apologize, especially don't like birds. I don't know what it is about birds. I have never liked birds. I don't particularly care for birds. Okay, you can laugh at me. That's all right. Don't love birds. But because I love my wife, I'll go to the zoo, and I'll even look at the birds. Okay, and so we did this once. Alyssa and I, she's not here, so I can tell the story however I want. We went to the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. Anybody ever been there before? Okay, it's a really cool zoo. It's right on Lake Michigan. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's free. But here's the thing with totally free, right? You get what you pay for, in my opinion. And so we go, to, we go to the Lincoln Park Zoo. It's totally free. But the cool animals are never there. Okay, the cool animals like the bears and the elephants and the lions and the tigers and rhinos and, like, all these cool things, they're rarely there. You go to the exhibit and you're like, oh, you look at the map, you know, and you finally get to the bear and you're like, am I in the wrong place? And they're like, no, the bear's not here. You're like, is this a zoo? Where's the bear? Where are all the cool things? And so this day that Alyssa and I go to the zoo, there is like nothing out. It was a hot day. They told us it was because it was hot, whatever. There's no animals out. So where do we get to go? The birdhouse. The birdhouse. It's basically all we got to see that day. And I swear, if you want to understand what eternity feels like, go to the birdhouse at the Lincoln Park Zoo. There is no end. I have pictures on my phone of signs from one room to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, saying more birds this way, more birds this way. And I'm thinking to myself, every room, from one room to the next, where is the exit, right? Good, more birds. That's what I want to see right now. More birds. Where are the bears is what I'm thinking. But good, there's more birds. It was not my favorite day. I hate the zoo, and I don't like birds, and it was not a fun day. And you're thinking, what does this have to do with anything? It's a fair question at this point. One other thing I remember about this day was seeing at the end of this birdhouse, you kind of step outside into this kind of big open zone, and there's this huge, beautiful bald eagle. And it's just, it's, it's just sitting there, and it is impressive. And I go and I look at the, the sign, you know, that kind of details some of the information about it, and I read that bald eagles can see small rodents like mice and squirrels and rabbits and things like that running on the forest floor up to two miles away. Two miles away. Eagles can see further than any creature on this earth. They can spot the tiniest little thing from a distance with ease. And when it comes to our sin, we are eagles, aren't we? When it comes to our sin, we can spot it in someone else the tiniest little thing 
a mile away. We have sharp vision when it comes to seeing the sin in other people's lives. We're able to spot the tiniest little thing a mile away, and we're good at that. We're really good at that. Eagles can see further than any other creature in the world. Humans can see sin in other people's lives easier than anything else in the world. What we're not good at is looking in the mirror. And speaking of bears, we got that video? This is my favorite new video. Watch this video with me and just enjoy. This is a bear seeing himself in a mirror in the woods. Let's watch it again, yes. Seriously. Look at him. He's just wandering. My, and then he sees a mirror. Whoa! So that's enough. Thank you. <laughs> so here's the thing. So we're like eagles when it comes to other people's sin, and we're like this goofy bear when it comes to our sin, right? Just minding our own business, and then we see something or someone points something out to us, and what do we do? We freak out, we don't want to see it, we jump left and right, we try and get behind the mirror, we throw the mirror to the ground, I don't want to know, I don't want to see. This is what we're not good at. We're not good at looking in the mirror. We're not good at seeing the sin in our own lives. We're not good at seeing our own lack of goodness. And what's wild about it is we have a log in our eye. And we're not good at seeing the log in our eye. It's there. I know it's there. You know it's there. Everybody knows it's there, but we're pretending it's not. It's not hard to see. It's why we like pointing out the specks in other people's eyes, right? Because maybe they'll look at the speck instead of the log in mine. Maybe if I can get everybody else looking at the speck in everybody else's eyes, nobody's going to be looking at the log in my eye. But here's the thing. And it's the next point in your notes, to be filled with goodness, which is what we're talking about this morning, we must first acknowledge and empty ourselves of sin, that which is not good. The first step on the path to goodness and righteousness in one's heart and therefore in one's life, did you know this, is not highlighting the lack of goodness in somebody else. And yet this is the first place too many of our hearts and minds go. Pointing out the lack of goodness in someone else does not make you more good. Pointing out the sin in someone else's life does not make you less sinful. The first step in acknowledging, in getting to goodness and in having being filled with goodness is acknowledging our own lack of it. It does not start with pointing out sin in everybody else's life. It, point, it starts with pointing out the sin in our own lives. Unfortunately, we tend to think that if we can do that, if we can point out all the specks in someone else's lives, if we can show everybody the lack of goodness in everybody else, it'll distract everybody and maybe even us from acknowledging that log, from acknowledging that sin in our own lives. And that really is as foolish as having a plank sticking out of your eye and pointing out a speck in someone else's. It's foolish. It doesn't make any sense and it makes us Hypocrites, says Jesus. First step toward being filled with goodness is not pointing out the lack of goodness in other people. It is acknowledging the lack of goodness in yourself. It's what we in the church call confession and repentance. Confession is acknowledging you've got a log in your eye. Confession is being open to say, I've got a log in my eye. And repentance is taking the log out. Repentance is removing the log. That's why Jesus says in verse 42, keep following along with me in your Bibles. How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. He says, first you have to see you've got a log in your eye. You have to first understand that you have sin in your life, in your heart. You've got to acknowledge it's there and stop pretending that it's not. Because you know what we like to do? Again, just like the log, we want to pretend it's not there. We don't want everybody else to see it, but probably even more importantly to us than that, we don't want to acknowledge it ourselves. We don't like thinking that we're not good. We don't like thinking that we're not sinful. 
We don't like thinking that we have logs in both eyes. We don't want people to see it, but we definitely don't want ourselves to see it. Jesus says, first, you've got to see it. You've got to acknowledge it's there. You've got to acknowledge that you have sin in your life. And only then can you take it out. Only then can you take that step of removing the log from your eye. Only then, Jesus says, will you be able to help your brother with the speck in his. Because guess what? The speck in the brother's eye is not good either. It's not. In other words, we have a communal responsibility to help each other see the logs and the specks in our lives. We have a communal responsibility to facilitate confession and repentance. We have a communal responsibility to one another. I have a responsibility to you. You have a responsibility to me and to everybody else in this room. This is the next point in your notes. We are all mutually responsible for emptying ourselves of sin so that we can be filled with goodness. We have mutual responsibility to one another. You know what people often do with this story or the, the verses preceding where it says, judge not and you will not be judged. What people hear is you have no right to call out sin in other people's lives. That's what we hear. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't say you don't have any right to call out sin in other people's lives. In fact, he's saying you should take out the specks. You should help a brother remove the speck in his life. In fact, that's a responsibility that you have. We should be helping each other acknowledge our sin. We should be helping each other confess our sin and repent of our sin. And we should be letting other people help us. We should be letting people point out the specks and the logs in our lives and allow them to help us remove them. But all that people hear when they read this story is, don't worry about the speck, just focus on the log. And Jesus doesn't say that. He says, get the log out first so that you can help your brother. Okay, we have responsibility to one another in regards to our sin. It's why in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, Paul says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? And I want to, I want to look at this just a little bit more in 1 Corinthians. So turn with me there if you've got your Bibles. This is in a, in a verse or in a, in a passage where Paul's talking about blatant, obvious sin in the church's life. There's a man who is committing deep, rough sin in his life, and the church is not doing anything about it. And, and, and Paul's saying, no, listen, you guys have to do something about it. He says in verse 9 of chapter 5 in 1 Corinthians, I wrote, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, which is what this man was. Not at all meaning that the sexually immoral of this world, uh, of this world, the greedy swindlers, idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Okay, Paul's saying, hey, you have to deal with sin, but you can't deal with the sin out there in the world. That's my job. If I was going to tell you not to associate with immoral people, you couldn't go anywhere, right? You couldn't do anything. He says, but now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside purge the evil person from among you. Paul's talking about the same thing in 1 Corinthians 5. You have a responsibility when you see sin in the body, when you see sin in the lives of people that you love and that you care about, and when they see sin in you, we have a responsibility to remove the specks and to remove the logs. And we need each other to help each other do that. It is those inside the church whom we are to judge. We're responsible to each other. And so I'm making a big point about this because I think, again, people read this passage all wrong. What they hear is, don't even think about other people's sin. Don't even talk about other people's sin. You're a hypocrite if you think about other people's sin. You're a hypocrite, hypocrite if you try to pull the speck out of someone else's eye. And Jesus doesn't ever say that. He says, get the log out first so that you can help your brother. We have a responsibility to one another, mutually responsible. In order to do that effectively, as Jesus taught, we've got to look in the mirror first. We've got to not be like that bear who looks at the mirror and freaks out and says, I hate that mirror. Right? We blame the mirror. 
We blame the Lord. We blame Scripture. We blame the brother who's calling out our sin. It can't be like that. We've got to look at the mirror and accept what's there. It's not the mirror's fault. It's us. We've got to look in the mirror and see what's really there and acknowledge it so that we can help our brothers remove the specks from their eyes and allow them to do the same in ours. So in order to be filled with goodness, we've got to confess. We've got to acknowledge the sins there. We've got to repent. We've got to pull it out of our eyes. We've got to help others do the same. And then Jesus continues in verses 33, sorry, 43 and 44. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying you can't fake goodness. You can't fake goodness and you can't hide your sin. This is the next point in your notes. At the end of the day, you need to know this. You cannot fake goodness and you cannot hide your sin. Good produce comes from good trees. Goodness lived out in our lives and being filled with goodness in our heart. It starts with being filled with goodness in our hearts. You can't fake it. You can't not be good internally and do good externally. And again, this is something that our world gets wrong. We think we can. But we can't do this. Good trees bear good fruit. And bad trees, we might say sinful trees, and I've had some of those in my yard. Sinful trees bear sin. Our hearts are known by our actions. Jesus is saying all these things to say the same thing. We are known by what people see. And what people see is an outpouring of what they don't see, of what's internal, what's in our hearts. One scholar said, you cannot produce the right kind of fruit if you are the wrong kind of tree. You cannot produce the right kind of fruit if you are the wrong kind of tree. Goodness begins in the heart. And it can't be faked. You can't fake your way to goodness. And you can't hide your sin. It will be known. That's why Jesus says in verse 45, the good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. Drop the metaphors, Jesus is saying. Here's reality. The good person, out of the good treasure of their heart, produces good. Good with the hands begins with good in the heart. And the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. He's making the point even clearer over and over and over again. A good person produces good in their lives. It starts in the heart. It starts with the treasure that is or isn't in your heart. And an evil person or a sinful person produces sin from the sin in their hearts. So there's this idea, and we've talked about this a lot because we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about this the first week. There's got to be a consistency. There is always a consistency between source and product. Okay, between the tree and the character of the tree and the nature of the tree and what it produces. The source determines the product. It goes back to the first part of this passage in verses 39 and 40. Like teacher, like student, right? Like tree, like fruit. And so the question that you need to ask yourself and the question that I've been asking myself all week is what's my source? What's in my heart? And therefore, what is being produced in my life? Knowing who we follow, knowing who we emulate, who we listen to, whether or not we'll acknowledge our sin, whether or not we'll empty ourselves of sin, whether or not we'll let the body of Christ help us do that is going to help us answer that question. But here's the problem. At the end of the day, we're in a predicament. We're in a predicament because by nature, our hearts are not good. Your heart, by nature, is not good. Good. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. None of you and not me are good by nature. So we've got a predicament here, right? Because 
goodness begins in the heart. The problem is every single one of our hearts polluted by sin. And so therefore, all that we're capable of producing in this world is what? Evil. Sin. That's all that we're capable of producing. By nature, we are full only of sin and evil. Not an ounce of goodness resides naturally in you, in your heart, or in me, and in my heart. So what hope do we have then? What do we do? Because goodness begins in that treasure in the heart, but if there's only sin in our heart, how can goodness possibly become a part of our lives? What hope do we have to be filled with goodness, let alone to do good? To whom do we acknowledge our sin? To whom do we confess and repent? Who do we follow and emulate that is good? Who do we chase after that is good? Who do we listen to and try to be like and obey that is good, that can instill goodness in us? Because it's not there, naturally. If good is what God approves of and we're only sinful by nature, how are we ever going to be included in that boat of God's approval? You understand what I'm saying? We're in a predicament here. We've got a problem. Jesus speaks about the treasure in one's heart that produces good. In one of his letters in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul calls the gospel treasure. He calls the good news of Jesus and who he is and what he has done for us residing in someone's heart treasure in a jar of clay. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. And so through faith in Christ and belief in the gospel, God does this incredible thing that we've been talking about for the past two months. He fills us with his own spirit. He sends us his own spirit to produce in us, among other things, goodness. Goodness that doesn't reside in us naturally is delivered to us through the Spirit, through faith in Christ and belief in the gospel. And when we put our faith in Christ and we believe in the gospel, we put our hope in Jesus and who he is and what he has done for us, and the Spirit indwells us, he indwells us with his own goodness. Because we don't have it on our own. We don't have any of these good godly things on our own. They only are ours through faith in Christ. And so in other words, and this is the last point, if you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember this. Faith that Jesus was good for us allows the Spirit to produce his goodness in us. When you put your faith in Christ, you're putting your hope, you're staking your life that he was and is good. That in spite of your lack of goodness, in spite of your sin, that this man, God in the flesh, Christ Jesus, is good, that he was good for you, and that when he laid down his life on the cross, it was for you. And when you put your faith in him and you believe that, that's what we call the gospel. God sends the Holy Spirit to fill and to indwell his people and to produce things like goodness that don't naturally reside in us within us. We're catapulted into this spiral toward goodness and not away from it. Because when that happens, we're not the blind following the blind anymore. We're the faithful following a good God. Father is goodness. Jesus is goodness. The Spirit is goodness. And if we follow and obey and emulate and walk in step with the Spirit, the Spirit will fill our hearts with goodness that we don't have any shot at attaining otherwise. And so the path to goodness in our hearts and therefore in our lives, it begins with acknowledging that Romans 3 is true and that you're included in that. It begins with acknowledging that you've got a log in your eye. It begins with acknowledging, I've got sin, I've got junk, I've got a mess. I know I've been trying to shove it down and ignore it for so long and I know I don't want everybody else to see it, but I'm acknowledging finally it's there. I'm letting the light of the gospel shine on it so that it can be seen, not just by others, but by myself. I'm acknowledging I'm a sinner. That's where it begins. And then it, the next step is taking that sin out of your life, removing the log, not just acknowledging it, but saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to sin in that way anymore. I'm going to pursue a new direction. I'm going to pursue a new God, not myself, but the true God. And it begins with realizing that goodness can't be faked. 
You can't fake your way there. You can't fake it till you'll make it. You'll never make it. You can't hide your sin. It will always become known. It begins with understanding that. It begins with understanding that we need someone to do something for us in order to be filled with goodness. That it's not there in our hearts, it's not there in our lives, that God has to do something. And realizing all of that drives you into the arms of a good God. When you recognize he is good and you are not. You know what, I would sum up the vast majority of the Old Testament in that sentence, God is good and holy and we're not. And once you realize that, it drives you to run to him because you know you need goodness. You know you need godliness. You know you need to be holy. You, need, you know you want all of those things in your life, but you also know I'm never going to get there on my, on my own. I can't earn it. I can't be it. I can't accomplish it. Only Jesus can accomplish it for you, and he has already done that. And therefore, all you have to do is put your trust in him. And put your faith in him and believe that he was good for you and that by his grace he has sent his spirit to produce that same goodness in you. The goodness of God and the goodness of Christ and the goodness of the spirit, it's the only way that we can be filled with goodness and that we can then therefore pour out goodness to others. Good trees, good Christians, good churches are only good because God makes them good through faith in the gospel. And they will, all, they will prove that goodness. They will prove that they've believed the gospel. They will prove that God has instilled them with goodness when they show that fruit to the world. When they show an outpouring of the goodness that's in their hearts with their hands. So let's follow this pattern toward goodness and to the onlooking world. Let's follow this pattern. Let's be quicker to notice sin in our own lives. Let's only think about the sin in others' lives after we've acknowledged it fully and completely in our own. And let's point out the sin in each other's lives. We have a responsibility to do that to each other. I need you to help me do that. You need me to help you do that. And then let's confess and let's repent and then let's turn to a good God. And let's never lose sight of the gospel that Jesus was good for us and that because he was good for us, his spirit produces his goodness in us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being good. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being good. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being good. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the truth of Luke 6 that shows us and reminds us and teaches us. We've got logs in our eyes. We've got sin. It's there. It's real. It's significant. It's inhibiting. And Lord, thank you for showing us that. Thank you for using a mirror to show us that. I pray that we would not be like the bear and freak out when we see our sin, but that we would see it, acknowledge it's there, repent, take it out of our lives. And that we would run to you, our good Father. Thank you for being good. Thank you for being good and faithful even when we are the opposite of those things. Thank you for instilling your goodness in us. I can't imagine to you from my eyes, it seems like it must seem like such a risk to send something as wonderful and good and holy as your spirit to someone like me. And Lord, I thank you that you took a risk if that's what it was to you. I thank you that you looked at someone like me and my heart and all the pollution and all the junk and all the sin and all the logs that are there. And you went to the cross anyway. You laid down your life anyway. Knowing that someone would scarcely die for a good person. But that you didn't just die for good people. You died for all of the worst people. And that's us. Lord, help us to realize that you have laid down your life. You've given up your life on the cross. You've shed your blood and allowed your body to be broken, and you went to the grave, not for good men and women, but for evil, sinful people like me. And that in your grace, you came back from the dead, and you invited us into new life, and you've given us your spirit to instill that same goodness in us. Oh, Lord, we should be singing with joy in our hearts when we just think about these things. Lord, help us keep our eyes fixed on the gospel, on the treasure of the gospel, to keep that treasure in our hearts to know that only belief and faith in Christ and only the presence of the Spirit in our lives 
allows us to live the way that you've called us to live. And yet, Lord, we also know that you've called us to walk in step with your spirit, to keep up with your spirit, to obey you. We ask, Lord, that you would help us do that and that our lives would be marked by goodness that people would see us as individuals, us as our families, us as City Park Church, and they would see the fruit of goodness, the fruit of godliness, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. That they would see that and that, that would be a testament to the work that you have done. That would be a testament that it would shine light on the goodness, not of us, but of you. And Lord, I pray if there is anyone here who has not known or tasted or experienced how good, how wonderfully good you really are, I pray that you would do that, that you would work, that you, move, that you would move, that your spirit would help them see you are good. You have demonstrated goodness to us. That you are a good God. We praise you. We worship you and we give you all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.